the god of rhythm games, the unavoidable Japanese EDM composer, and the arbitrator of memory. These are just a few of the names Camellia has managed to earn himself over the years, known today as one of the most notorious composers in the electronic genre, let alone rhythm games. Aside from his strong melodies, production, and absolute sound design wizardry, perhaps the biggest thing Camellia is reputable for is his ability to genre bend. You could give Camellia a genre that he'd never heard before, and he would be able to come up with something that's on par with even the greatest artists amongst that genre. Because of this and his background in rhythm games, unavoidable could not be more true. Even if you don't like a certain track or style of his, he has such an abundance of others that you're guaranteed to find something of your taste. And rhythm game wise, the variety of his discography makes him the perfect candidate for those that are looking for a song to make a chart out of. Whether you want to make an easier song for beginners, or you want to make a gauntlet testing even the best players in the world, Camellia is the man for the job. But you ever wondered what Camellia first sounded like? And how he went from a completely unknown Dojin artist to collaborating with the likes of Toby Fox? If so, you've come to the right place. Let's go back to the beginning. Born on September 28th, 1992, Camellia was born as a kid stuck in an era that was transitioning into a world that would soon be taken over by a digital renaissance. And because of that, when he was younger he spent a lot of time on the internet. Particularly, he was addicted to playing online flash games on his mother's PC when he got the chance. And because of that, he ended up making a lot of online friends. Music wasn't really something that was in the mind of young Kamatech. Until one day, when he was around 10 years of age. That day, one of his online friends decided to make a rather absurd request towards Camellia. They had asked him to compose a theme song for them, and although Camellia had no prior knowledge in producing music, he still took the leap and simply replied with, I will do what I can. The only equipment he used to create his now lost theme was his mother's PC, in which he used the Microsoft GS MIDI synth to create the melody. From then on, Camellia had become hooked onto the idea of creating music, and from elementary to middle all the way up to high school, his tracks would mainly be experiments in DTMs as he figured out the ins and outs of music production. It didn't just end there however, Camellia also began to play instruments by this time, and while over time he would show a staggering proficiency in multiple instruments, one of the most significant instruments when he was younger was the drums. See, in 2006, Six, when he was about 14 years old, he joined an online brass band called the VIP Brass Band, or its alternative name, the VIP Wind Orchestra. This was a group of individuals that summoned people from around the internet nearby to learn parts of a piece, usually a popular game song or classical piece, and eventually end up joining in an actual in-person ensemble. Obviously, there are a lot of dangers that can be involved in this, especially at the time where doing this was a pretty new concept, but nonetheless, Camellia was allowed, and he became a regular part of the VIP orchestra. It got to the point where Camellia was put in charge of organizing the band's recordings and uploading them onto Nico Nico Doga. These are in fact some of the first videos from Camellia's Nico that are still intact today. In the description for multiple performances, Camellia is sometimes seen talking about the drums, for example saying that the plane was tight or the bass drum was too loud, so it's safe to assume that he was behind most of this, and clearly he was already holding himself to a pretty high standard. Shortly after beginning to upload these performances, in October of 2008, he would also begin posting on his own personal blog on camtech.csat.net, where he would occasionally mention his experiences with said brass band, and also post some of the experiments that I mentioned earlier. Most of these are unavailable, but the posts themselves contain a lot of information on what to expect from these. For example, in November of 2008, we had a post simply titled, I think the bass is important. The bass guitar is actually one of the multiple instruments that Camellia also learned to play when he was younger, and it was one he was said to play quite a lot. In another post, he released two tracks, one titled HH.mp3, and another titled Min.mp3, which by the sounds of it is a minimal track. In this, he expresses some disinterest with minimal, saying he isn't sure about it, but he guesses he should repeat it. And this turns out to be true all the way till now, as he states in a recent interview with the Comic Fiesta yeah. community. Also, also, I don't like something repeating, like I can say. Uh, I, I mean, like some. Do you know minimal music? Oh, like, like, like yeah, some music that repeats. Regardless, it was clear that over time, he was building up his experiences of many different genres, and this early exposure would explain the nature of his style later on. Hell, at some point during this time, Camellia did a full a cappella of the legendary Lucky Star opening. Indeed, you heard me right. Camellia had already been developing his vocals this early. In case you don't believe me when I say he tried everything. <laughs> As you can probably guess, his development in vocals will be important to him later, and it goes to show that even when he was in high school, Camellia remained a man of culture. Additionally, during this time period, one of the biggest things Camellia had interest in was the infamous Yume Nikki, a game depicting the story of a young girl navigating her deeply disturbing dreams. Well, I guess 
calling them dreams only goes so far. In fact, it was safe to say that Camellia was a massive fan of the series, and his love for the game went so far that he decided to remix some of the soundtracks in the game. This is very similar to how Nanahira started with her singing, with the I tried to sing challenge, except this time, Camellia would try to do a I tried to make Yume Nikki a certain genre. He did quite a few of these over the years, but his earliest one is the I made a Yume Nikki medley with MIDI, where he made a MIDI piano arrangement that spanned various tracks from the original game. On the 25th of July, 2008. This is pretty impressive for one of Camellia's early tracks. After all, this was an arrangement that was just over 9 minutes that transcribed a lot of the soundtrack and made them transition between each other in a smooth manner, a lot of which was likely done by ear as well. He would end up doing several more of these kinds of remixes in succession of each other, with some very interesting genre turnouts for a sound as minimalistic as Yume Nikki. For instance, there's one where you try to make trance or techno out of the melody that plays when you approach Marsan in game. The choice of melody is the biggest deal here. Chance is a genre that focuses a lot on atmosphere, and a strong but distant melody. And while there is a lack of atmosphere in this, the melodies fleet and feel more than makes up for that. There are some interesting additions as well, that to me feels like foreshadowing for what would be later to come for Camellia's style. The biggest thing being some of the use of splicing around here. And to top it off, Camellia would end up adding onto the melody in the final chorus to create an impactful end into the song. which nowadays is something that he's notorious for. Carrying on from these, it wasn't long until Camille had then started actually contributing to fan games with his own personal soundtracks. In particular, he was a contributor to Yume Tuki, one of the largest fan-made variants of the game that's considered by most to be the sequel that was never made official. This now massive game started off small on its initial release on May the 26th, 2007, and a few years after, in June of 2010, Camellia would release his first contribution to that game. The patch for version 0.090 I contained a new area called Monochrome Federal Japan, accessible from the Arts Gallery, and with this came several new background tracks, including a set of them called Camellia Underscore Japanish and Camellia Underscore Japanish 2 Dot OGG. Both of these are variations of each other. One plays in the new area added, a very large and strangely peaceful landscape, to the point where it's almost unsettling. This place is actually pretty infamous because of how big and featureless it is, and the music doesn't help with keeping your sanity as you traverse through this zone. The constant repeated melody is enough to make any player descend into madness after enough time. The other track plays in one of the creepiest rooms in the entire game. In order to access this, you must be in the Broken Faces area, which sounds disturbing enough already, and whilst you're there, you may find a mouth with a white face that has bleeding eyes and white hands beside it. You know, the usual. The mouth kind of resembles a gate, as you can see. Enter it, and the scene changes to Danger Panic Zone, where this track will play for as long as you scramble in there. Clearly this is a more frantic version of the monochrome Federal Japan theme, capturing the atmosphere of what's happening on screen pretty well. If I didn't know any better, I would definitely guess that this is the type of theme that plays when you're nearing death. Of course, these tracks are relatively simple, but so are most of the tracks in the game, and Yume Nikki does have a specialty in using bare minimum tracks to create a skin crawling experience, which Camellia took and did very well to prove his early versatility. So, throughout the course of 2009 and 2010, Camellia would continue doing various remixes, covers, and soundtrack contributions to Yume Tuki, as well as another Yume Nikki fan game called If. This stuff had yet to show what Camellia was truly capable of though, and it turns out that concurrently, Camellia would begin taking his music much more seriously and begin improving at an alarming rate. Theoretically speaking, this would mean he'd have to double down on one specific genre and try to master that. And while he doesn't follow this rule completely, as you'll soon see, the one he would eventually end up going for is something that most of his fans today don't even know he used to produce, Vocaloid. It all began with the release of Man Man Mite Chin Chin Oki Oki. The song description details, I try to make a song about the mystery of life with Miku. Sing along. As you can see, it starts off pretty tame. It has a pretty nice tribal feel to it, and the vocals are basic, but enough to establish a decent flow. A juice harp is also played throughout the song, which is said to have been done by Satsuki Gatenkomori, a vocaloid producer who may sound familiar, and at the time was already pretty well established. In fact, Camellia had referred to Tenkomori a few times in some of his blog posts, so they were clearly already pretty good friends, and well, this wouldn't be the end of their collaborations. Anyways, this all seems well and good, until...
the song suddenly transitions into some raw vocaloid metal, which is something we hadn't previously heard before, but it's something that makes sense considering what we've seen from him. It surprises me just how well he nailed the guitar and the heavy sounding drums, especially when he said in the previous posts that out of learning piano, guitar, and bass, guitar is the most difficult. This is also when he began to delve into listening to vocaloid, creating a list to keep track of some of the things he discovered. Coincidentally, the very first song he added on here was a song using Haruka Nana, who might be someone you recognize if you know anything about Nana Hero, but we'll come back to that later. Through this, Camellia gained inspiration to create more Vocaloid, which was great to see, and it wasn't just any Vocaloid either. There's a surprising amount of variation between the instrumentals and some of the stuff here. For example, with Miku as a virus, it has a breakbeat, neurofunky kind of style. Whereas a coupon that makes the main unit 4,000 yen cheaper, guess the long title has always been a comedian's blood, uses elements of chiptune and has much more of a math rock vibe to it. Again, it was evident that Camellia was not only experimenting a lot between genres, but he was also beginning to combine them. And not only this, but you can see his biggest strength begin to shine early on, his strong melodies. His ability to create strong melodies that stick to a listener long after the song is finished is something that Camellia is known for. And not only this, but he also seems to be capable of bridging multiple melodies together in some of the most creative ways I've ever seen. It's also funny because the gap between a coupon and his first Vocaloid song is about six months, yet the difference in quality feels astronomical, not even just talking instrumental wise, but also vocaloid wise. Miku was tuned this time to sound so much cleaner, and this is something that you'll see Camellia shine at later. Sometime in between this, in July of 2010, Camellia had signed up for his first ever competitive music contest on a now defunct website called Crayofuga. This was a free online music contest community that generally works to increase the activity of small creators and discover talent. A certain contest had been going for the release of a vocal album, which was a collaboration between the Tokyo Digital Arts School and Crayofuga, where six tracks were released. The goal of the contest was to get the players to remix two selected songs from this album, Wonderland and Time for Departure. You were provided with all the vocal a cappella needed to create a completely different song and well, from there you could do whatever you wanted. May the best songs win. The best five to be exact. Camellia chose to remix Time for Departure for this contest, talking about how the song was very rocky and he wanted to tap into the song's strong world to depart. He cited that there was a lot of use of pop and club techniques, in particular the use of a stutter effect, which as explained by the man himself is a technique that simply cuts the sounds to create a different, different, different groove. This use of stutter was part of why the judge looks highly on Camellia's song. The judge was actually surprised by the use of stutter and the detail that went into the remix, and with that Camellia's song was able to earn 5th place overall and get a judge special award. This was a pretty big deal at the time, since Kreofuga was a decently sized community when it was still around, so this put a bit more eyes on him, and it was something that Camellia could use for bragging rights. He did express a little disappointment in his placement. He said he was a little dissatisfied and really wanted to win the Grand Prix prize if possible, but he was happy he won anything at all. After all, it was always next time. All of this built up to Camellia being able to hit his peak in terms of production when he released his first ever album, Honey Ginger Owl, on the 3rd of October 2010. This album did feature all Hatsune Miku, but several songs have their own distinct feel to them. And man, the raw talent this man possesses really does shine throughout the entirety of the CD. The first song alone, called a lonely dream should be enough to tell you what you're in for. Between the amazing drum lines and breakbeats, which dip into some uncharted time signature territory around here, the catchy and strong melody, and the amazingly tuned vocaloid. I could mention much more and talk about the song all day, but the point is, this is only his first album, and already he's shown he's in his own league. Generally, the album follows the same pattern as the first song, heavily centered around chill rock and breakbeat vibes, and using very strong and somber sounding melodies, which matches well with the album title. When combined, Honey and Ginger is a good solution to relieving yourself of pain and relaxing the muscles, and honestly, this album has the same effect. Well, for the most part, the one that comes closest to breaking that rule is the debugged version of Miku as the Virus, a version extended and made to sound slightly more intense. This is definitely the one that screams EDM, even though it isn't. Regardless, all the songs are crafted in such a way that they have this level of beauty about them. You can really feel the emotion put into each track, and for me, that was at its strongest in the final song of the CD, Winning This World. It 
Again, considering that Camellia began Vocaloid production in January and has managed to come to this level in October of that same year, it's genuinely pretty absurd. And to top it off, this really went under the radar. And I really mean that. I wouldn't be surprised if less than 5% of the people that eventually come to watch this video even knew Camellia did Vocaloid, let alone knew this album existed. But it was a project completed by Camellia nonetheless. And even if he wasn't turning a load of heads yet, he definitely had the potential if he kept going. It wasn't long after this until Camellia returned again to Kreo Fuga for another contest. We saw what he said last time. He's aiming for the gold medal and he won't be satisfied with any lower. The question is, will he follow through on that? That would depend on what the contest actually is. It seems that this time around, Kreo Fuga was collaborating with a label called LGR Label, a company that sampled CDs and DVDs of drum sounds. And for this contest, contestants were given kits of drum sounds from LGR Label and you simply had to create a song from that. The best judged song wins. Now this is something that I'd really like to hear since the concept sounds pretty interesting, but as far as I'm aware this is lost to time, so we'll never see what Camellia did with this, though we can be sure it was nothing super exciting at the time. So far, Camellia has demonstrated an insane intuition when it comes to creating good drum rhythms, and there's no doubt he did the same here. This caused the creation of the song, Where You Are In The World. And not only did this end up winning the gold medal, it was basically deemed nothing short of exceptional. A judge for the song pretty much wrote a mini essay analysing the song, and a lot of what they wrote was of the highest praise, considering it was coming from a judge, with the best sentence to sum it up being, producing such a song requires advanced programming skills and a unique sensibility, and I thought he was a wonderful author who has both. Camellia responded back with a comment of his own, where he goes into a bit more detail about the production process, and shortly after he won the Rhythmworks Complete Edition 2 as a prize, an over 20GB CD that contains 35,969 sounds of various drum and percussion samples. It's safe to say that he had enough sounds for a lifetime. If all of this doesn't show the insane improvement rate of Camellia in just a few years, I have no idea what will. And the best part was that it certainly wouldn't end here. In fact, the best years in Camellia's career lay ahead, and that streak begun in 2012 arguably one of the most inventful years for Camellia. The year began with the release of I Will Witness Your End in February of 2012. Another Vocaloid song, yeah yeah, but first of all, listen to the beginning. Do those sims sound a bit familiar? Because this is probably the first time you hear them from him. Actually, this song's instrumental has a lot of elements of ADM sprinkled in with the drum breakbeat, and it sounded pretty unique for its time, to the point where even Camellia gave it a new genre name, Miku and Bass. And well, on top of the song just being a general banger, this gave the song what it needed to make a bit of a wave when it released. As one of Camellia's most viewed earlier songs, this sits at just over 100k, and it was the first time he truly began to make a big break as a vocaloid producer. Meanwhile, the world was enjoying the first edition of the now popular Sound Voltex, Sound Voltex Booth, released by Bemini. And well, Camellia has had his fair share of rhythm gameplay when he was younger. In fact, one of the first rhythm games he played was Dance Dance Revolution when he was really young, so it was only natural that he would soon hear about this. And it just so happened that Sound Vortex would run a music contest a few months down the line, just before its release. The first speed up contest, which is also the first ever remix contest held for Sound Vortex. Here, artists were given a list of memorable Bemini songs, and beyond actually remixing, they had one simple task, speed up the song as much as you can. There were some super good choices here, but one of these was the obvious pick for Camellia. See, there's one artist that Camellia has always idolised and been inspired by when it comes to music. Ever since he first started, and that person is Nekomata Master, someone who's widely considered one of the best rhythm game composers, period. The song included from him was Sayonara Heaven, and Camellia created his own Nekomata Electro Remix, which became one of the winners of this contest. That's right. This was Camellia's debut to the world of rhythm games, and on August 3rd, 2012, it was finally added to the booth. For something called the speed up contest, I definitely expected something much faster, being only clocked at 150 BPM, but that doesn't take away from how good this song sounds, and how much of an evolution it is from some of the other stuff we heard. This is the moment where Camellia adopts his distinctive electric style, reusing a lot of the sounds that we've heard previously from I Will Witness Your End, and combining it really well with Nekomata's song, which had some heavy influence of Celtic music, as you can hear from the accordion and flute. Sayonara Heaven is an incredibly beautiful song, and Camellia took that beauty for himself to create something that sounded good, and suitable for a game such as Sound Voltex. The intuition that he already had about rhythm games allowed him to be able to create something that's sufficiently challenging and constantly changing. And that's something you come to notice about Camellia's songs as he begins to transition more into rhythm games. The songs never stay the same and they are unrelenting in that fact. This also marked a point in Camellia's career where he would be in a position to also gain some international exposure thanks to Sound Voltex getting international exposure. But the point where that's noticeable wouldn't happen until much later. 
By true nature of the relationship between these two genres, Camille would then end up dipping his toes into the Toho Dojin scene almost immediately after this. The thing is, Camille had already become friends with a man called Masayoshi Minoshima, who just so happened to be the lead of Astro Ameria Records. Yeah. That Astro America Records, one of the most reputable Dojin circles responsible for the imperishable Toho remix, Bad Apple, among countless others. Camille would first feature in Astro America Records under the album The World's Destination in August of 2012, with that debut being in Comic Head 82. And in this album, Camille contributed only one song, In the Flickering, a complex remix of Kana's theme from Toho 3. This was actually something that said a lot about the direction Camellia was headed. Before, he used to do a lot of drum and bass, breakbeat based things, but now he was producing a lot more complex show. In fact, this is a common pattern across all the things we've seen from Camellia so far. There would be a period of time where he focuses a lot on a certain genre. Then he would take that genre and combine it with elements of the other genres he's done. It's an effective way to build intuition on many different types of music, to be able to make music that hadn't been heard before. But I digress. The track impressed Masayoshi Minoshima, and from here, the relationship between these two deepened to the point where Camellia would begin to feature in more albums on Astro Ameria. And eventually, Masayoshi Minishima wanted to launch an entirely new label called Downforce. It was unclear what the motivation behind this was, but my best guess is that he wanted to move away from doing Toho remixes to producing original songs. The debut EP, Airfoil, was going to be an album mainly based around that concept. And for that album, not only did he himself produce two songs, but he invited Kamiya to also produce two songs of his own. And these would end up being No View and Unsure. These would end up releasing on December of 2012. And sometime later, there would even be an official YouTube channel for the label. Though this channel is very inactive and only has two of the four songs uploaded. Both of the songs Kamiya produced were complex sugar laws. And just like with Vocaloids, when it came to the direction of the composition of his electronic songs, he was improving at an alarming rate and proving to us again that he has what it takes to become a massive artist. That being said, it was also around this time Camellia released one of his biggest Vocaloid songs to date, Systematic Love, a song that actually combines Vocaloid and Complex Show to create what's one of my personal favourites from Camellia's Vocaloid era. <laughs> This ended up blowing up to 300,000 views, by far one of his best performances of this era. And it got so popular that some years later, in 2015, Real would end up making her own cover of the song on her YouTube channel, which sits today at over 4 million views. At this point, his blow up in Japan would be inevitable, and in 2013, he would take that one step further, thanks to a certain individual. Remember how I said Camille had a Haruka Nana song in one of his playlists back in 2010? For those that don't know, Haruka Nana is an Utao, something similar to Vocaloid, whose voice bank is from none other than Nanahira. Now I go into a lot more depth about the relationship between Camille and Nanahira in my video about her, but to cut a long story short, Camille began working with Nanahira when they expressed mutual interest in each other's works. They began to work on an increasing number of albums and collaborations, and eventually there came a time where Camille needed Nanahira to sing for one of his tracks for a certain Bemini competition. This track ended up being Bass Job Freaks, and it's said today to be both of their breakout songs because of how unexpectedly popular the song became under the release of Beatmania Pendrel. But if we're looking at Camellia on his lonesome, then Bass Job Freaks was only part of his breakout. There are two sides to every story, and apart from Bass Job Freaks, there was one song that he could not have anticipated going this far. Fast forwards to August of 2013. Camellia has just released his sixth Vocaloid album, Stance on Wave, which contains some of Camellia's past work from Vocaloid, like Systematic Love, as well as some new compositions. Actually, here's a fun fact. This is technically Camellia's sixth album, but on most records, the album that came before this was Camellia's fourth album, CTCD 004, Make No Sequence. What happened to CTCD 005? This is something I've only seen mentioned on the Camellia Discord server, but CTCD5 is actually a pretty obscured album called Flow Arrow, consisting only of three songs, pre-sound, the flow arrow, and the instrumental to flow arrow. Not entirely sure what happened here, though apparently the serial number was accidentally called CTCD4 instead of 5 on release. And to be honest, it just seemed like a pretty scuffed CD in general. The titular song is incredibly good though, and it can actually be found in Stance on Wave under the same name. Speaking of, compared to something like Honey Ginger Owl, this deviated a lot from the classic chill breakbeat atmosphere of that. Now the songs were generally much more aggressive and electronic with their sounds, and we were now at a point where you could safely say that Camellia has found his own unique sound.
it's hard to explain, but if you listen to a lot of Camellia and you then listen to a song from his album such as this, you'll be able to recognize pretty quickly that this is Camellia, even though it was made over 8 years ago. This wasn't the only reason this album is significant. This is actually also Camellia's final Vocaloid album to date, and from this point onwards, there would be a noticeable decrease in his activity as a Vocaloid producer. Until there's none at all. Why is this, you may be asking? Well, there were simply other things that he wanted to work on that wouldn't give him enough time for it. Most of this was a lot of Dojin works. As you can see here, Camellia went crazy with the contributions to many different Dojin circles, far too much to sift through in this video. But one thing that was beginning to take priority was rhythm game music, and there was one really good opportunity that was just around the corner for Camellia, the Konami Arcade Championships. The Konami Arcade Championships, or CAC for short, is one of the biggest annual game competitions held for the best national players in specific arcade games from Konami. And these games can range from card games to rhythm games from the Bemini series. For the CAC of 2013, the concept was simple. If you'd like to participate, you must first play the qualifying round where you have to select a group of songs and try and get the best cumulative score you can on them. Depending on the song group you picked, you're then placed in group A, B, C, D or E, and out of the hundreds of potential people in that group, only the top 3 will advance. These 15 people, along with one other Asian representative, then advance to the final round, where the 16 final competitors compete in varying ways according to each game to determine the winner. At this time, Sound Vortex 2 Infinite Infection was out and about, so you could probably guess that this game had its own championship contest, and for the final round, the 16 players would participate in a classic single bracket elimination style tournament. Generally, each round would have the players play two songs concurrently, and whoever has the highest cumulative score across them wins. <laughs> well, that is until the finals. To honor the best players of the world, instead of playing two, four of some of the most difficult songs are played in succession to determine the Sound Vortex champion. It's a pretty big deal, and in order to really set the scene, they need to make sure the songs they pick are appropriate for the setting. This is where the CAC 2013 Original Song Contest comes in. This is a song contest that's held in celebration of the CAC, but the biggest detail is that now, these songs will be judged to get a best songs category. The two best songs from this contest would immediately be taken and adopted for play in the Sound Vortex 2 CAC Championships Finals. This was a huge opportunity for Camellia, but the competition would prove to be incredibly fierce. There were a lot of other well-known artists participating in this, and this contest was responsible for some big songs like Black or White by Black Y and Siramaru, Verse 4 by Yu Asahina and Yamajet, and 4 Ultra players by Cosmo, who would end up winning the best song overall at first place. So the big question is, if Cosmo was first, who would be second? Well, <laughs> he did it. Clocked at a blistering high BPM of 234. This song is dubbed as a boss song because of just how difficult it is. In fact, at the time this released, this and Four Ultra Players were considered the two most difficult songs in game for a while. And upon hearing the song, it's pretty easy to understand why. This is probably the first time you've heard Camellia dabble in speed core so far. He understood that he had to create high speed rhythms if he wanted to really challenge the finalists. And not only did he do that, but he also did it with a lot of style. Every second that goes on, the song is developing or changing in some way, and he transitions between each of them effectively featuring good use of some electric guitar, unrelenting voice samples, and a pretty catchy melody to end with, which, according to Camellia, is very reminiscent of Max Burning by Black Y. Again, Camellia shows off his ability to create some very strong melodies, and it all comes together to create the perfect song for a final showdown. Now, obviously, featuring in the final two songs of the Konami Arcade Championships is a massive deal, and it was this, alongside Bass Shop Freaks, that allowed him to break through not only in Japan, but internationally, especially once Bang & Burst released in the game in December of 2013. The song stands today as one of the most recognizable from the Sound Vortex series, and to top it off, it got one of the coolest song trackers to date. But oh boy, 2013 didn't end there. I think it's pretty clear by now that Camellia was beginning to transition into pure electronic music, and the release of his next album on New Year's Eve of 2013 proved that. This was Paroxysm, which on its own means an explosion of intense emotion, and it was Camellia's first fully instrumental album, featuring 8 songs. The title could not be more right. The album is a very intense rollercoaster of emotions and genres, ranging from some chill glitch hop to only the dirtiest of dubstep you can find. The song that sounds out the most in this album though, definitely has to be Fastest Crash. I would say this is the best song to really show the results 
results of Camellia's slow musical build-up over the past several years. Because man, what a journey this song is. How Camellia managed to make each section transition so smoothly when they sound completely different is honestly beyond explanation at this point. The song is most definitely one of Camellia's best works to date, and I highly recommend the album as a whole as a definitive introduction to what Camellia sounds like. After this, Camellia would become much more active in producing electronic music. In 2014, he would focus a lot more of his efforts on album work, releasing another three instrumental albums, The Fraction, Sudden Shower, and Dreamless Wanderer, each one being better than the next, and he would continue with contributing to Bemini and helping Nana here with her music. Wait, speaking of contributions to Bemini, there was a certain group that Camellia would end up becoming associated with. As you know, the Bemini series uses a lot of music from a ton of artists, and they all make super good music. But there are some artists that not only make good music, but consistently makes good music that ends up being consistently adopted to Bemini works. All the way back in 2006, a handful of these artists got together to form an entirely new label that would eventually become an official dedicated in-house recording label for Bemini. It started off with four members, DJ Tucker, DJ Yoshitaka, LED, and Tatch, under the name Beat Nation Records. The history of this label is quite a turbulent one. Not even a year after joining, Tatch left Beat Nation Records and pretty much abruptly stopped all activity regarding rhythm games due to health problems. He would end up returning later, but not to the label. Then, in February of 2007, three new artists joined, Sota Fujimori, Korsuke, and Ryu. This was the official group, and they would continue contributing to Bemini until the release of Beatmania 18 Resort Anthem in 2010, where the entire label would cease activity and be put on hold. The reasons behind this are unknown, but it would occasionally get a mention here and there on some Bemini streams, until one day in early 2012. A note, part of which is still on the official Beat Nation Records website to this day, was put on here, and it spoke about recruiting new members for the label. Then, later in 2014, the group was fully revived at the J-Po 2014 event, in which a new member was introduced, the one and only Nakamata Master. <laughs> And there was plenty more where that came from. There were to be seven additional new members after this, each one chosen by an old generation B Nation Records member as their successor and revealed as the months went by. The first to be announced was DJ Toto, chosen by DJ Yoshitaka, then Homaju, chosen by Kosuke, and so on until the Bemini stream that happened on the 10th of April 2014. Here, it was revealed that. <laughs> Chosen by Sota Fujimori as a successor, Camellia became an official member of Beat Nation Records, which would later be changed to a new name, Beat Nation Rise, in July of 2014. Not only did this mean Camellia was now a certified top pick if Bemini were looking for someone for music, it also meant that he could contribute indefinitely to all the Bemini series if he really wanted to, along with some other perks like being able to release albums on the label, all of which are huge opportunities for him to continue to grow. This label sounded really promising and they were certainly going to deliver, with most of these artists dominating Sound Vortex contests and continuing to contribute to the Beatmania titles. Hell, in August of 2014, there was even a collaboration album with Hardcore Tanoshi, literally called Beat Nation Rise vs Hardcore Tanoshi, in which Camellia did a KABOOM remix of Mothership by Sota Fujimori. As he continued releasing music, naturally his fanbase continued to grow, though again, overseas, no one really knew his name, that is, until August 16th, 2015, with the release of what's widely considered to be a legendary album. Planet Shaper. As Camellia's now fifth instrumental album, the sound of his electronic production had evolved to a point that was almost too good to be true at the time. And the sound gets so brutal here that it's enough to dishape a planet, according to Camellia. Pretty much all the songs here are incredible, and a lot of them have a very similar structure. The song starts with a simple melody, transitions into the main section, and then the most melodic part of the song drops, which today is known as a Camellia drop. This is extremely important, because these melodic sections are a huge reason why these songs will end up becoming so loved. They all have a super catchy and energetic melody that sticks to you so that you want to come back for a replay and perhaps share it to your friend. There's a pretty good video by Celestro you can check out that goes into a bit more depth about this and his song's compositional structure. But to sum it up, this album is the peak of Camellia's melodic strength and he does a good job using his sound design skills to create incredible songs that range from dubstep to electro to gabba to speedcore. Hell, here's what's personally one of my favorites from the album, Why Do You Hate Me, which I don't even know what genre it would fall under. But out of all of these, there are three songs that caught the attention of everyone. 
Flying in the Flow of Deep Sea, Delta for the Delta, and Camellia's International Breakthrough, thanks to a certain rhythm game, the legendary Exodus Earth's Atmosphere. Like I said, the melody in this one is what makes it so flashy and memorable, and the entire song seems to feel like a build up to this part, even though the parts before this could be a song on their own. It started off pretty slowly for the first year after the album was released, but after a while, this song blew up on YouTube. Why was that? Well, this is where Osu comes in. On the 6th of October 2016, legend player Ruchi mapped a 7.56 star difficulty version of Exodus Earth's Atmosphere, and this became ranked about a month later on the 9th of November. As one of the hardest songs at the time, this song naturally ended up becoming really popular, and as time went on, more and more people discovered Camellia through this, and other songs that would begin to get mapped or were already mapped. He began to feature more and more in tournaments, being used for countless tiebreaker songs, until it was official. Camellia had become one of the largest composers in rhythm game history, and he was still growing. It was at this point, Camellia began to ramp up the work rate in regards to his electronic music. He's released many more albums that are all excellent in their own right, done some of the best collaborations we've seen, done soundtracks to rhythm games, done soundtracks to actual games, check out The Dweller's Empty Path by the way, featured as a guest in the furry conference. The list goes on for what Camellia has managed to accomplish in his years of composition, and the most impressive thing about it all is just how fast he's able to pump out music that sounds this good. As a matter of fact, in that same Coffee Hour interview, he said that a lot of his songs can take anywhere from a week to just a few days to create, which is an absurd work rate. Now, obviously there's a lot of things as of recent I'm not talking about in detail here, but that's because I wanted to focus far more on Camellia's early years, since that's what tends to be the things people know least about. I'm not sure about you, but it's pretty unbelievable to see the route that Camellia took to get this far. And as someone who's been following and enjoying his music for years, seeing him now be this popular puts a massive smile on my face. Who knew that someone who started off making a theme song for one of his friends would become one of the fastest growing electronic music composers of today? Not only do I hope this was interesting for you, but for anyone out there who's composing music or pursuing any long-term dedicated goal, I hope you see that it's all about patience and being dedicated to whatever it is you do. Sure, there's people that are talented and will grow faster than you, but at the end of the day, hard work will outlast any of that. Well, unless you're doing something physical, in which case you better pray to God that you have some good genetics. So even if things don't go your way, don't let them mislead you from your vision. Oh. And I get the feeling Camaria will see this someday. So if you ever do, it's a simple message really. We all love you man. Never stop doing what you're doing and be sure to take care of yourself. That being said, do be sure to support Camellia's music. Links to his platforms are in the description. And as always, if you enjoyed, leave a like, subscribe. I would say dislike, but YouTube's bitch ass rude them anyways. And follow me on Twitter. Oh, and if you want to interact with me and other like-minded people with similar tastes, then feel free to join my Discord server. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in a bit.